Hello everybody. I'm not entirely sure who's in the room. Let me let me see who's with me. So far, nobody. Aha! Hello. Uh, so we'll just use this first uh, few minutes just to try and familiarise ourselves with the system. So we've got uh, down the bottom, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with Zoom and I have to be honest, I wouldn't profess to be an expert, but you've got things like chat. So there you go, happy days. Hey, you, you, you managed to, you managed. <laughs> cool, we're all here. So there's, there we go. So there's some chat and uh, We've also got Q&A, so if you put Q&A in here, then if you want to ask me something that we can do at the end, uh, we can do that. Let me ask while we're just mooching around here, waiting for everybody to join, uh, let me just give you an idea of the format. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to share this with you. So you'll be able to see my dismal face and you'll be able to see this seminar. Uh, what I'm going to do is use this PowerPoint presentation as a kind of broad uh, framework just to keep me on track because this morning's session, well, to say it overran would be a bit of an understatement. Unfortunately, I can't make, you know, with PowerPoint, you can make this, the individual slide massive, the whole screen. It's tricky to do that because when I come in and come out, it, the, the, the Zoom software doesn't like that very much. And, and sometimes we lose the video and the audio, uh, which for some people, that might be a good thing. But uh, there you go. And uh, right, we've got 14 people so far. We've got way more than that, though. So uh, we've got a few minutes. Can I ask if you, uh, let me just stop sharing the screen and go back to me. There you go, I'm back here. Uh, for people that are in the room uh, right now, uh, can I ask, are any of you really pushed for time? Just because, as I said earlier, the earlier session I did this morning, <laughs> it, it, it really ran. It really ran on. And uh, I know some of you maybe have better things to do than listen to my chat. I hope you do. Uh, okay, so no one's really pressed for time, so that's okay. Um, there you go. Right, okay, well, it's pretty much five o'clock I make it. No, Charles isn't pressed for time. Herb's not pressed for time. No, you've got all the time in the world. That's pretty... and and, and, and <laughs> Michael's retired. My, my, you, 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 you've cracked it, Michael. That's what everybody, we're all there. Uh, okay, your wife will want to dine at some time. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah, me too. I mean, so we're all cool. So I think we're all on the same page. Right, okay. Well, let's crack on and stop. Uh, so let's go back to the screen sharing. And anybody who's late will just have to uh, suffer. Perfect. Okay, so here we go. So... Just to give you a bit of an outline of as to the, the, the way that this is going to work out. So, my name is Phil Bennett. Some of you may, you won't have seen me before. I doubt you will have seen me before, but you'll have heard my, my voice. Uh, I host the channel, Gyrocopter Flying Club. Uh, predominantly, that, was, uh, that, ca that came uh, with more energy because of the virus. And uh, I've got a flying school, gyroplane based. Although I do fly helicopters and I also fly uh, air, fixed wing aeroplanes aerobatically. Uh, but I'm a gyroplane instructor. And with the virus, obviously nothing was happening. And so I gave a little bit more energy to the channel. And initially, uh, the, the questions that I was answering uh, or posing were ones that students have asked and people email. And there's a common theme. And this, the reason that the, the first live stream if you like is based on accidents it's because number one there's a general you know there's a there's almost a macabre interest isn't there in uh 
aircraft accidents. It's why uh, the Discovery Channel in the US have got a whole, you know, 18 season program on aviation accidents. And uh, of course, I don't know, I know some of you fly, I know some of you don't, but typically, <laughs> if the US and uh, Europe is anything like the UK, when you tell people that you're flying a gyroplane, literally, you may as well have said you're going to go and do some shark diving or you've got a crocodile for a pet. They literally can't think of anything more dangerous uh, than, uh, than flying a gyroplane. So, yes, I, I agree, uh, Roger. Uh, you know, we, 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 learn from, we learn from accidents, exactly. And, and that's, you know, part of what hopefully we'll get from this. So um, what we're going to run through is some history, because I think it's very good to understand some of the background to where we're at. And then we're going to look at modern gyroplane and the early developments. Uh, and then we're going to dive into the accidents. And hopefully at the end of it, I'll give you some uh, pathways and some ideas as to how to keep you safe. But the good news is from the outset, although the gyroplane very often is seen as a death trap, and definitely in some parts of Europe, you, you were not allowed to fly a gyroplane until very uh, recently. Um, actually, it's not. The, 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 the key to this, or one of the um, overarching views from this, is the fact that very much the pilot uh, is, is behind most of the problems. Right, let's move on. So, this is actually a Sierra C-17. Uh, it wasn't the very first Sierra aircraft, but it was one of the first. And you can see that it was based on uh, a fixed wing fuselage. In fact, this was something called an, Av an Avro Avian. And an Avro Avian would be a biplane, but what they've done is they've chopped the top wing off and replace that with a rotor. And uh, the reason that they used aircraft fuselages is because for directional control in pitch and in roll, they still retained the aeroplane control. So you've got ailerons for roll, elevators for pitch. This guy here, uh, Joan de la Sierra, we're probably all familiar with. The big contribution for de la Sierra though, was the fact that he resolved the problem of dissymmetry of lift that comes with rotary wing uh, aircraft. As we may know, and I'm not gonna, it's not a, this isn't a science lesson, uh, but I'll just touch on it. And pilots, certainly uh, gyroplane pilots, I'm sure are familiar with this. Obviously the advancing blade that comes into the uh, relative uh, wind as a result of the aircraft movement is gonna gain a benefit from, uh, from, that, from that wind. And the retreating uh, blade, sorry, the retreating blade is going to have a detriment to that. What that means is there is a difference in airflow on the advancing and the retreating blade. And because of the lift equation with velocity squared, that has a big effect. And if it hadn't have been for De La Sierra working out the fact that if you could make the blades flap, uh, advancing to retreating blade, uh, obviously the aircraft just wants to naturally roll uh, to the advancing side, which effectively would have a greater velocity airflow. So this is uh, an Avro 504, which would have been common First World War aircraft. And I, the reason I like that picture here because it gives a great indication of these ailerons. So what they've done is they've chopped most of the wing away and they've just left it with, the, uh, with some ailerons for roll control. And one of the early problems for gyroplane accidents in this period was as you come into land, as this uh, aircraft is, you can see that you start to need quite big control deflections because don't forget aeroplane controls are aerodynamic controls. So as the airflow typically in landing, particularly, as the airflow starts to become slower, you need greater control movements. And I like this picture because it shows the huge control deflections or the, you know, the quite large control deflections as this aircraft is coming into, uh, 
to land. And what tended to happen is early accidents, they just lost. If they got too slow, particularly in the landing phase, uh, they just lose uh, roll control. Uh, and obviously, actually, at some point, once you've got a level of pitch, you then don't really have much control authority to unwind the, the, the movement that you've imparted initially, because as the speed bleeds off, you know, the elevator of, you know, you lose elevator authority, basically. Uh, this is a picture mainly just to just to highlight that even this is a C-20. This was an aircraft that was into the 1930s. Uh, this was a licensed aircraft, uh, this in particular to Fokker Wolf. And again, you can see the wing and the uh, ailerons. The reason that picture's in is for the benefit of our friends in the US because uh, the early Pitcairn aircraft, and this is a Pitcairn PCA-2, was based on that C-20, which is common to Fokker Wolf and so on. So that's that. This is a picture of a C-19 uh, having a bit of a moment. Definitely that would have been subject to some kind of uh, formal reporting it had it existed at the time. And the reason for this is just to show you that the problems that happen today in takeoff and landing and takeoff and landing accidents today are by far the most common. It was the same back in the day. It's just perhaps we didn't have such a formal uh, reporting structure. Uh, this is fast forward to the C-30. And this would have been the first gyroplane which did away with the aeroplane aerodynamic uh, devices, for ailerons and elevators for roll and pitch control. So now you can see a little hanging stick and the picture that I come to next will show it more clearly. Uh, that basically manipulate, the pilot now moves the rope, basically rotates, sorry, moves the rotor head, which not only now the rotor is not just giving lift, but it's also giving roll and pitch control. The other thing to note from this advert, this is basically an early advert, you'll notice here, it says that we don't have ailerons or elevators, but we don't have any rudder. And the consequence of having no rudder, as we'll see in a little while, this is just the picture to show you the hanging stick, you're probably all familiar. The consequence of having no rudder meant that Bearing in mind in period, uh, this is, so the C-30 was a mid-1930s aircraft. This is an extract from Flight Magazine, uh, which was probably the, the most authoritative global uh, publication, probably actually ever, in uh, aeronautics. Uh, they've got a great archive. This is uh, an extract from the archive. And they highlight here that the method for landing in particular means that you need to land dead into wind. You can see here, must naturally terminate dead into wind. And that's because uh, you don't have a rudder. So, you know, you can't deal with crosswinds basically because you're always gonna, it's always gonna weathercock uh, the aircraft. Now, of course, back in that period, it was probably quite easy to do because most airfields were fields. You know, they didn't particularly have uh, any defined uh, runway and so it was a bit of a free-for-all and of course the, the number of aircraft operating were you know appreciatively less than what we've got today. Okay before I move on to this next section any I think we've got everybody that's going to join us here now any questions any any thoughts in chat no all good happy good okay perfect so why the gyroplane? Well, we're probably all familiar with the narrative where Delacy ever invented an aircraft that couldn't stall. And that's actually as important today. And I think it's probably an area where, this is just a personal view, but I think that the modern gyroplane, the people that produce them have, have completely lost their way. They fail fundamentally to extol the, the biggest virtue, which even today is, 
is the fact that they can't stall and spin it spin in and i'm not sure of the data from the us but in the uk ga fixed wing accidents the biggest killer i thought would have been you know controlled flight into into terrain during bad weather but it isn't it's still today 50 percent of fixed wing fatalities are still stall spin uh, events and that for me is incredible and i'm surprised that uh, gyroplane manufacturers don't push uh, this point more uh, of course you'll you'll gain a descent if you don't have any uh, forward speed you will sink but you'll always be under you know you always have directional control which is a big thing uh, that you wouldn't have in a fixed wing aircraft the other point that Sierra used to push quite uh, quite a lot was the fact that when you're flying cross country, if you have an engine failure, and don't forget in the 1930s, 20s and 1930s, engine failures were going to be a lot more common than they are today, just simply because of where the, you know, the uh, evolution of, of, of engines and material science had got to that point. What they were wanting to highlight is the fact that even if you're over open country, you're always going to find somewhere to get in. And that's, again, another huge virtue which remains today is that we can land an autogyro or a gyroplane, gyrocopter, same thing, um, in a very short distance. They're, they're, they're hugely uh, capable in that regard. And from an emergency or precautionary landing perspective, they do give you options that you probably wouldn't have uh, in a fixed wing. However, that said, not everybody was interested in the virtues of the autogyro for the autogyro's sake. This is a picture of a guy called, uh, this is actually Raoul Hafner in a machine of his own design. Now, Raoul Hafner was an Austrian guy that um, was naturalized into the UK, did all of his business in, uh, in England. And uh, he wasn't interested in a gyroplane other than the fact that he saw it as a stepping stone to the helicopter. He was a, an aeronautical engineer and his big contribution, which is still in existence today, he invented the collective pitch. So this is a, a lovely diagram again from flight, which shows the rotor head of the Hafner gyroplane. And what he had, if you imagine, uh, gyro, pure gyroplane, let me just get myself into the camera, there we go, pure gyroplane just got a stick and obviously, you know, pitch and then uh, laterally for roll and uh, which would be, as helicopter terms, uh, that would be what we've known as a cyclic, except it's not really correct to call it a cyclic in a gyroplane because it doesn't alter the pitch of the blades, you actually move uh, you just tilt the entire rotor head. But what, what Hafner had was a true cyclic so that as you moved the, the stick, it altered the pitch of each individual blade cyclically, but then you also had a collective lever, which if anyone's seen a helicopter, when you pull the pitch, when you raise the collective, you basically add pitch to all of the blades uh, collectively, which is why it's called a collective. Hafner, very clever guy. Uh, he ended up being the head of Bristol Aircraft's helicopter division and designed, this is the Bristol, well, he designed many helicopters ultimately. This is probably the earliest one, Bristol Sycamore. It was a late 19th, it was basically a post-war uh, European helicopter. It was in fact the first helicopter to gain a uh, civil, you know, like a, a sort of, certification for uh, commercial flying and uh, sold well. British military used it extensively. I think the Luftwaffe uh, Marine Flieger, probably, I think the Dutch also uh, took these uh, helicopters uh, extensively. And you can see this is a picture of the rotor head for the Sycamore and it's exactly the same as the uh, Hathner gyroplane. Okay, so Gyroplanes pretty much ended after, well, Second World War uh, was a you know, major event in everybody, 
uh, everybody's life that was around at that time, undoubtedly. And uh, because of the technological progress that war, uh, you know, the necessity of war brought about, uh, the gyroplane di died a death, really, because the helicopter was the thing that overtook it technically. And if you think about it, aviation uh, developments tend to follow the military because it's the military that tend to fund these programs. And, you know, by golly, they become expensive. And so, uh, especially also the fact that, in truth, the US were not that, you know, the US from a gyroplane point of view were in certainly for a large part licensing European Sierra brand product. Uh, and obviously Sikorsky invented uh, the first practical helicopter and the US just backed its own really. And once you've got the might of the US, which were, you know, militarily after the Second World War, you know, by far the dominant, uh, the dominant player and, and everybody kind of aligns with that really. So it took until the 1950s, mid 1950s, and a guy that I'm sure you're all familiar with, Igor Benson. This is what he produced. Uh, this is the Benson B7. This is actually the first uh, B7 that arrived in Europe. It was uh, on the UK register, based at Biggin Hill. And uh, without dwelling too much on these aircraft, we'll run through them quickly. The key elements to this are that you can see that the, the rotor control was done by an overhead stick. And much in the way that you would control perhaps a flex wing uh, micro light today, so you would push the bar away the pitch or pull it towards you and then you would rock it from side to side for roll control. It did have a motorbike uh, twist grip uh, for throttle and of course initially that made that wasn't a confusing thing in the sense that this aircraft type didn't exist before so it wasn't as if that method of control was contradictory to anything else. It perhaps was influential, in my opinion, on the early uh, accidents that befell uh, fixed wing pilots that were converting because, of course, they would have been, you know, more familiar with the with the stick that was mounted on the keel. Um, but and of course, you know, pitch control. If you imagine a stick, you know, forward stick equals uh, nose down pitch, whereas forward on the bar. Is, is, is completely the opposite. So that may uh, not have been the ideal thing, but, but that did change quite quickly, as we'll see with the Benson B8. This, and the only reason I've got this in here, is just to highlight, this is an extract actually from the American Helicopter Society. Uh, this was effectively Benson's press release in 1955. And one key thing to note here is the prop diameter. See here, the prop diameter is only 42 inches. Nowadays, props are beyond 60 inches. It's only a two-blade prop as well. And so you've got to imagine in the context of 1955 and the B7, it wasn't a high-performing aircraft. And in fairness, neither was it, that wasn't the ambition. You know, the ambition was to get people flying and to have some fun. And, you know, performance wasn't really... Uh, the forefront of, of the machine's uh, needs, really. This is a Benson B8, actually a picture in 1973, but B8 came around in the late 50s, early 60s. And uh, this is just a nice picture of one. I'm just showing you because you can see here, we've moved to a, a, a stick uh, mounted on the keel. Uh, similar size prop, although this I can tell from the heads is a McCulloch two-stroke and the early B7 used to have about 40 horsepower from a two-stroke motor. Uh, these uh, McCulloughs were either 70 and I think eventually became 90 horsepower uh, two-stroke engine. Uh, still with the set with the fuel tank on the side which uh, wasn't really a huge problem other than you know as, as people's desire became more to performance. Uh, people tried to, you know, I know that uh, Ken Brock had a seat that the, the seat contained the fuel tank and 
others later moved the fuel tank to a central position. This picture is just a, well, I, first of all, you can see the United, the United Kingdom has some gray old days, but also I just wanted to show you the, uh, the stick arrangement. And this is just a nice indication of these sticks when they were mounted, they weren't mounted on a keel. So when you went forward, let me just move. So normally forward stick is, is mounted. So as you go forward, you've got this lateral movement with the hand. These, these sort of early uh, centrally mounted sticks were actually hinged underneath the, the rotor mast. So that as you went forward stick, you went down. And as you came with back stick, the stick came back towards your sort of tummy. Not to, you know, the chest is probably too high, but certainly into the tummy. And the reason I mention that is because from a stability point of view, in terms of pilot-induced oscillation, that's not a very easy thing to manage because the stick, you can't, you can't use the stick as any form of stability because it just falls away, if that makes sense. Uh, also to note, this is a Rotax two-stroke. This is a 1990 picture. This is way, be, you know, it's kind of fast forwarded, but, and you've got a three blade prop. So you can see that people eventually are trying to get performance. This is a back to the seventies. This is a Campbell cricket. Campbell used to be the importer for Benson in the UK. And uh, you can see now we've got a, uh, a nice pod, fuel tank mounted centrally behind the pilot. Uh, this was actually a Volkswagen four-stroke, two, still a two-bladed prop, and these were relatively benign performing aircraft. Actually, they weren't they weren't uh, rocket ships, and they didn't profess to be. This next one was starting to get to performance, uh, higher performance. This is something called a Brooklyn's Mosquito. That guy in the picture is a guy called Ernie Brooks, which we'll uh, learn a little bit more about him soon. Uh, he actually was uh, an interesting chap in the sense that he was one of the very first gyroplane pilots in the UK. He was a gyroplane instructor. Uh, he probably got getting on for one of the highest number of hours logged in gyroplanes globally at the time. This is into the 60s. And he was also one of the very first guys that put a Volkswagen four-stroke onto a gyroplane. Uh, he was, by trade, he was a, a mechanic, an uh, automotive mechanic. And uh, he had a passion for, 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 for aviation and certainly gyroplanes. And he'd been involved in doing his own thing with, basically he started with a B7, then he bought a, they modified that to a B8 uh, and with a Volkswagen four-stroke motor. And he'd been doing that since kind of 62, 63. Uh, and then he ended up with this Brooklyn's Mosquito, so the 67, 68. Uh, this is a development from the Mosquito, it's called the Hornet. Uh, the main difference between this Mosquito and the Hornet is it's now got an offset gimbal uh, rotor and uh, the, the motor I think is consistent but the offset gimbal is the, is the big change from the, the spindle, they call it a spindle head um, on, the, on the older one. Uh, and just for completeness, these are some Wallace uh, gyroplanes and the reason I'm showing these is just to show in a relatively short space of time the way that gyroplanes have gone from relatively simple uh, open frame aircraft uh, and certainly in the B7 with, with literally no interest in performance to people trying to make the gyroplane something that it probably isn't. So this is the WA116. Uh, it's on a military registration because this is one of a batch of three aircraft that ended up with the Army Air Corps in the UK on trial. It was an unsuccessful trial. But then the WA-116 uh, quickly became this. It's still the WA-116. You'll see that aircraft in the James Bond film uh, as Little Nelly. Uh, but it's just a podded, you know, more aerodynamically efficient, uh, well, if a gyroplane can ever be called uh, aerodynamically efficient. Uh, they, but, you know, they've tried to clean it up. The engine um, was slightly tuned. And although the, the legend of Wallace is that he never, ever sold these aircraft to the general public, that's not true. He did. He sold at least two of these aircraft, one 
to uh, a scientist that was out in, well, he ended up working in the Far East, and another to a flying club in Norfolk, and he would have sold more. I mean, Wallace, Wallace is one of the few guys that effectively sold the same aircraft to many companies several times over because he always retained the design rights. And then when the company went bust for various reasons, he could then resell and spin it out to somebody else. This is a 1975 aircraft, uh, or so, sorry, the picture is from 75. I think the aircraft is from uh, 1970, 71. It's a WA120 and you can see now that we've just gone full aerodynamic, uh, enclosed, uh, higher speed, it's a four bladed prop. It's actually a Rolls Royce Continental motor. And uh, yeah, we've now gone completely away from the, the, B, the B7 that we had uh, in the mid fifties. However, one of the things that I guess was a feature of Benson is he, he was very successful at selling these uh, gyrocopters. Uh, in 64, he was second only to Bell Helicopters in terms of rotorcraft on the US register uh, with 330 uh, aircraft on the register. And I think one of the things that he was certainly aware of was the fact that he had encouraged people into aviation that were not naturally air-minded. You know, back in the day in the 20s and 30s, people that would have been flying a uh, Sierra or Pitcairn uh, autogyro would have been either wealthy amateur people with nothing better to do. You know, they were people of leisure uh, or professional pilots, um, you know, either, either serving in the military or professional pilots commercially. And of course, the psyche and the thought process for those people would be more natural than the average Joe that's buying a kit that he's going to build over in those days, you know, bear in mind, early Bensons, they weren't kits that came in a box so much as you were physically making things on a lathe uh, and so on and, 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 and forming parts and building rotors. So, you know, they took, they were probably multi-year uh, programs. And uh, Benson recognized this. He created a movement called the Popular Rotorcraft Association. I'm sure some of you that are in the room with me today are members. Uh, it's a fabulous concept in the sense that Benson wanted to get people informed. He wanted to, he wanted to find a mechanism to communicate, not only, look, obviously, you know, the guy was a marketeer, but it wasn't just a pure marketing concept. He genuinely had a, a desire for, you know, engineering best practice, flying stories, uh, and editorial comment to try and indent, engender some element of safety because he was for sure aware that things were easily, you know, gone off the rails. And this is where we're going to look at next. Are, are, are you all still with me? Yeah, I think we are. Perfect. Happy days. So, accidents on the early signs. Oh. Before I move on, one second, someone's asked me a question in the chat. Yeah, perfect. Happy days, you're all with me. Right, okay, so this is obviously uh, some, of the, some of the good stuff, some of the information's kind of got diluted over the years because, you know, information and record keeping isn't necessarily uh, what it is today with databases and, and everything available instantly. And that's the other thing about the PRA. You've got to remember, in 2020, if we want to find anything, we go on the internet and literally within, within seconds, we can have the most complicated engineering and scientific journals on our screens to print off. Uh, I say print off because I hate reading things on screen. I don't know why I like to read things with, with physical paper. But anyway, but the point is, you can get that in seconds. And, you know, you can get that stuff from the greatest scientific minds in the world, you know, guys from NASA can, you know, their stuff online and it's, it's great. Back in the day, if you were a guy in the middle of England with a gyroplane and you wanted to understand a little bit about how these things flew, well, I mean, how would you go about it? There wasn't 
you know, you'd need to wait. The, the, the PRA magazines came out quarterly, so you have to wait for the next quarter's edition. And uh, probably you've asked the question, you know, via a handwritten letter, they've had a look at it, and then it might have been a couple of quarters before someone ever got back to you. So, you know, you ask two questions, and that's the whole year gone. So you can see, you know, the, 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 the barriers there. Anyway, this is an accident report from 1965. Uh, Benson used to have flyings at uh, his own, well, at the airfield that he was based at, the factory was based at. And uh, whilst it doesn't say it here, I know the background a little bit to this because I've read, actually, if, you, if you're a member of the PRA and you look at the archive section, I think the magazine that records the events that have unfolded here uh, is in the archive section. So that's a great uh, resource from the PRA. So basically what's happened, this guy, the, the flying was over multiple days. I think, uh, I think two days in actual fact. And on the final day, it's always gonna have to be the final day. Someone said to this guy, would you mind doing a bit of a flyby so I can take some pictures? Of course, he's all delighted and made up. I think this was a particularly nice, uh, nicely built aircraft that they wanted to capture on film. And of course, this chap, you know, look, he's gonna perform his best, isn't it? We're all men, we don't wanna, you know, it's probably, very proud, and he's given it big licks. Although if I look at the data, it says here he's got eight hours on type. I'm surprised his wife wasn't pulling him back from the shoulder, but there you go. And fundamentally he's crashed. And I think what he was doing is he was, he was pulling up and doing some wing overs and then returning back to the target, wing over, back to the target and so on, just trying to keep the, the display a bit tight. And unfortunately, uh, he's made a mistake and it looks like he's unloaded the rotor and it says here the aircraft became inverted in a pushover after a climb and when we're sat here in 2020 if you're familiar with gyroplanes that's probably you know you understand where that's gone however that was 65 and this is an extract from a PRA magazine in 19, I think the magazine was 67, 68. And it just records all of the accidents from the NTSB from 64 to 67. And you can see that actually, if we look at the accidents that are happening here, there's nothing that's particularly aggressive. As in, you know, look, Bear in mind, these aircraft are, are, are kind of, most of the guys here, there's no instruction. They're teaching themselves to fly. And they're all pretty low time, you know, the, the, so the data is date, whether the injury is minor, serious or fatal, uh, the type of accident, what they think the cause was, that's the NTSB, pilot error, mechanical failure or an engine failure, and then a little bit of narrative and the number of hours that the pilot's got. And if we look at that data, that wouldn't be a surprise to anybody in 2020. You've effectively got low time, low time pilots uh, trying to get themselves, you know, up to speed with a new aircraft. And they're having, you know, roll over on landing, roll over on takeoff, hard landing, hard landing. You know, it's all common stuff. When you look at the fatals, you've got a couple where it says uncontrolled crash. And if you look across the remarks, it's basically where the pilot has also tried to re-engineer uh, the aircraft to his own design spec. I mean, <laughs> why would you do that? But okay, uh, they, they paid with their life. So I guess, uh, you know, they, they, they've suffered enough. Uh, but outside of those, there's not really a lot of fatalities other than one guy here where he said he didn't intend to fly i guess that was because he died i guess either <clears throat> he died later having told everybody he didn't intend to fly or his mate said well that wasn't the plan and then another guy here which has got insufficient experience with one hour on time and uh, it says he had some pilot induced oscillation and zero g so i guess that was an observed event because of course bear in mind a lot of these are single pilots aircraft typically people find people that are dead 
just because they're, you know, they're a greasy spot on the landscape. There's not really much uh, evidence other than that. So the next set of data is from 67 to 68. And now there is a little bit of a trend where we're getting quite a lot of low time, high speed, abrupt pull-ups, followed by a bit of a pushover and some zero G. And I think that Benson and the people around him at the PRA kind of started to recognize that this was a trend. And the reason, I, and well, first of all, let me just, for those who may not know, this is actually a diagram uh, that was produced by a guy called Yuka Turbamaki um, in 1989 to describe an accident that happened then. But nevertheless, the event's the same. What tends to happen is that obviously the rotor develops rotor thrust, which in normal uh, flight, in no under normal 1G, provides rotor thrust, which opposes all other forces and keeps the aircraft stable. As soon as you bunt, i.e. Uh, you're in a climb and you give forward stick, as soon as you start to unload the rotor and experience uh, G levels of less than unity, i.e. less than 1G, what happens is the airflow is now no longer going up through the rotor disc, so the rotor is slowing. And as soon as you slow the rotor and lose rotor thrust, two things happen. Firstly, you lose the stabilizing effect that the rotor thrust gives. But secondly, the rotors themselves start to lose their structural integrity. So what happens is now the thrust from the propeller starts to become dominant, which is why the, 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 the nose, the, the aircraft nose is over and tends to also roll. And at the same time, the, the rotors comb the opposite way, striking the prop and the tailplane. And the PRA produced this little article. This is an extract. And I'll send you a copy of all this. So don't worry if you're working off a smaller. I'm on a big Apple Mac here with a big screen. So this looks readable, but you may, you may not be. Uh, but I'll send it to you anyway. But all this, it's amazing in the sense that this is mid-60s and, the, you know, the, the community is completely aware of the potential problem. Here, Benson starts to put uh, warnings and alerts into the manuals that he sends out with his build kits. And so you would imagine that by the mid-1960s, we would have nipped this in the bud because... Anybody who's anybody around gyroplanes knows about the dangers of negative G or low G. I mean, you don't have to be negative D. You could be, you know, you could be 0.1 G and it's still potentially a problem. But we are aware of all of this. So we'd think we'd keep ourselves safe. Sadly, wasn't to be. Now, I'm focusing on some UK accidents. And the reason I'm doing that is because I think in my opinion, it's because of these accidents that happened in the UK that, well, certainly the, the final accident that happened to the Wallace aircraft in 1970, that was a watershed moment for gyroplanes of this type in Europe. I know places like Holland banned uh, gyroplanes after, after that. Uh, you couldn't fly a gyroplane in 1971, 72, uh, and it completely killed uh, the market in the UK and there were some reasonably big innovative companies in the UK in this field and, and that was stopped uh, because of that. So the first one is our friend Ernie Brooks. Now unfortunately Ernie Brooks doesn't come out very well or, he, or should I say history is not very kind to Ernie because if you don't research him you don't realize the detail of this guy. As I said to you before, this guy was one of the world's most experienced gyroplane pilots, and he was an instructor. But the problem is, because his background was automotive, people reflect in popular media that this guy is a garage mechanic, and he's making his own aircraft, and it just sounds a little bit, a bit Mickey Mouse. 
people, it's easy to make this guy sound like an enthusiastic amateur that's cocked it up. And what happened uh, with Ernie, and uh, I won't get the report out. I, I, I'll send you a report if you want. I've got the links and everything, but the problem is I can see the time we, we need to crack on. But, but effectively, Ernie's problem was similar to the one with the guy at the PRA convention. And what actually was happening is that Ernie had got some, bear in mind, the, the accident that happened to him was March 1969. Prior to that in 1967, you remember that the James Bond film came out with Little Nelly and the, the appetite for this kind of aircraft went absolutely to the moon. So everybody was trying to monetize and exploit that opportunity. And this guy was one of them. In fairness, he made quite a nice job of it in the sense that he was positioned at a point where he had already spent four or five years making a very nice Volkswagen four-stroke uh, conversion. And you can see the aircraft that he's flying, this is the Mosquito, actually looks very contemporary for, for its time. So he got some investors that wanted to spend quite a lot of money and, and buy the design off him. And he was doing an impromptu air display to those people to try and sell the concept. And he once, like the other guy, uh, in a wing over type maneuver, unloaded the rotor. And that was the end of Ernie Brooks. Uh, it wasn't quite the end of the Brooklands uh, gyroplane company. Uh, he had sort of an apprentice that resurrected it with some investors, which was where the Hornet came from. Sadly, that guy also died. I mean, you can't make this stuff up, really. A guy called Brian Loosley. He was at, actually at a, uh, an organized air show, and uh, the weather was a bit inclement, and some of the other uh, displays couldn't, couldn't display because the weather was bad. So he said, oh, I, I can do it. This is, you know... I, this kind of stuff, low cloud, blah, 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 is a speciality. And he made a mistake and that was that done. And at the time, that wasn't all that impactful in the sense that it was easy to, to, to pigeonhole these people as, you know, eccentric Englishmen trying to build an aircraft in their garage. And let's be honest, if you go back to that picture um, I had earlier of Ernie, literally, that was his garage. And so it's easy to, 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 to create a label. However, you couldn't do that with Ken Wallace. Uh, in 1970 at the Farnborough uh, air show, uh, the sister aircraft to this uh, crashed. Uh, killed the test pilot, a guy called John Judge. John Judge was, um, well, I think he had the DFC actually from the Second World War. He was a Tempest ground attack pilot. Um, he was very well respected. I think he had almost 10,000 hours uh, in fixed wing. He was part of that Army Air Corps trial. So he was a gyroplane pilot uh, anyway, although when he crashed this aircraft or sister aircraft, uh, he, hadn't, he, hadn't, he wasn't very recent. As you can see, the aircraft uh, it's very aerodynamic. It, it's a Rolls-Royce Continental uh, aero engine, four-bladed prop. You can see all of the undercarriages fared in and so on. And obviously Wallace had a lot of engineering respect anyway. And uh, at the Farnborough Air Show, which is pro probably at the time in 1970, the, the biggest uh, aeronautical show in, in the world, and as a result of his death, again, another wing over, uh, low G, uh, the AIB uh, really went to town. Uh, they did a lot of simulating, a lot of modeling work. In the end, didn't really give any more insight than, the, than what the PRA had been writing in their magazines, you know, ten, uh, five or six years before. Uh, but the problem was, whereas you could say, oh, well, you've got some eccentric guys, crashing Bensons or crashing Brooklyn's mosquitoes that they built in their own shed. You couldn't say that with it. This was a proper aero, aero company with a proper test pilot at the world's biggest aviation show. And unfortunately, the, uh, the report that was produced from the AIB took four years to come out. So you've got this huge vacuum of literally, you know, for, to everybody else, 
knowing nothing for four years and it completely changed uh, the, the fortunes of, of the sport in gyroplane. Of course, <clears throat> time is a healer. And uh, at some point, one second, I'll just grab a question here or a bit of chat. Would you say that Ben, okay, so question, I'm not sure what you can see actually. So I'm just saying, question. Would you say that the Benson and Wallace crashes were due to pilot errors? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, without any, without any question. I, I mean, look, when I say Benson accidents, there's obviously, you know, there were 330 Bensons. I'm sure not all of them were, were, were pilot error. But all these low G, look, you've got to realize, let's, uh, let's hope that we're air-minded in the room. The one thing that we know not to do is, uh, is do impromptu air displays. And actually, even the Wallace accident, even though it was at Farnborough, was semi-impromptu in the sense that Farnborough Air Show at the time was a four-day affair. And for the first three days, Ken Wallace himself had done the display. On the fourth day, uh, there was a business meeting and the company Airmark, and the reason I know this, by the way, is it's all, if you go through flight, um, the archive of Flight International, it, it's all there. Uh, so, Ken was wanted in a business meeting and uh, he couldn't uh, do the final day's display. So they'd asked the company test pilot, John Judge, uh, if he'd do the display. So I'm not entirely sure what build-up he'd done, or I'm not entirely sure how familiar he was. But in the end, if you read the AAIB report, the, I mean, it's a big thing, and I'll send you a link. Um, he basically, number one, he flies the aircraft out of limits anyway. But, he, but, but what happens is he pulls the thing up and, and basically at the top, rather than keeping some back stick and loading the rotor, he, he unloads. And as soon as you unload, uh, you know, you can imagine with the, with, the, with, the, with the effect of this aero engine, it just, it just rolled him and, uh, and, and in he went. So th that was a, a, terrible, a terrible thing. And, and really, it was only because it was Wallace and it was, you know, a guy that everybody in the industry would have said, well, you know, it can't happen to him. And, and, and we'll come to that kind of comment. That kind of comment has come to bite recently with the Chris Lord accident, in actual fact, where, oh, well, if it can happen to him, it can happen to anybody. And of course, for the four year period where the AAIB hadn't reported, you know, who was ever going to criticize a 10,000 hour military pilot, company test pilot, war hero, no one's ever going to go, well, it must have been pilot error because, well, that just sounds arrogant, but it, but it was. So, Air Command. Oh, hang on. Uh, good, right. Air Command. So, as I say, time is a good healer. And uh, you may all be aware, you may not be aware, but there was a, a, a terrific character. And, and I say terrific character with emphasis on the character. A guy called Dennis Fetters. And what Dennis did was a terrific marketing job, really. He produced this, the Air Command. Uh, <laughs> I love these old pictures, by the way. It gives a great impression of uh, the United Kingdom uh, at its best. Lovely grey day there. But the reason I bring this picture uh, is it gives a great, imp a great impression of, the, of that stick. Remember we talked about that. They call them uh, a pump action stick. And if we look at the next picture, capture in your mind the way that that stick, uh, the, you know, the dyna, the, the, um, the, the, yes, the, 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 the way that, that the, the mechanics of that stick, and now look at the way the pilot is sat. And that to me, it just looks wrong, you know. It just looks that if you get in, I mean, I'm quite an experienced pilot and I think I'm quite a confident guy, but that to me just looks, if you got in turbulence, you're not going to feel that you're going to be comfortably sat in that aircraft to me, you know, and no wonder, I know it's easy to sit here in 2020 with the benefit of hindsight, but I got to say, no wonder low time people that weren't used to this got in trouble. And this is a two seat air command. So it wasn't true that there was no two seat training. There was two seat training. The problem was 
you'll know this guy, uh, I think actually, by the way, for anybody that's interested, the guy in the picture with his face towards us, I think that's Jerry Spake, who is the CEO of Autogyro. Because Jerry, at one point, was going to get involved with Air Command, but that's a different story. Air Command, apparently, it was a lovely kit. Went together really well, came with two engine options. One was Rotax 447, which was the low power version, uh, or there were 532 or 503. Uh, they had a model uh, change during the period. And the thing was, the delta between the low power engine option and the high power engine option in terms of money, it wasn't a great difference. So, of course, men being men, what do we do? Yeah, ship in the big engine because I'm going to be needing that in five minutes. And the problem was, because it was a two stroke, it made the majority of its extra power, you know, in a narrower uh, power band towards the top end of the rev range. And of course, it was uh, an accident waiting to happen. And the UK, uh, these are NTSB uh, accident reports where they talk about the, the gyrocopter is very light and, and sensitive with the controls and it's possible to over control it. A lot of uh, zero G, low G uh, events. And so it happened in the UK. We ended up with, in well, you can see from April 89, to uh, early 1991, we had five fatalities. And unfortunately, at that point, a UK CAA cried enough, uh, and in conjunction with the AIB, uh, they took an airworthiness review, pulled all of the permits from these aircraft, grounded them all, and that's where the Glasgow University aerodynamics study comes from as a result of the air command accidents. Interestingly, for me, is that one of the other recommendations beyond the Glasgow University report is the fact that they recommend that there's an approved syllabus for gyroplane pilots to include training on a two-seat gyroplane. And one of the problems was, although there was a two-seat aircraft available, as we saw in the picture, the guy actually that was the importer in England for Air Command was a guy that you may all uh, have seen uh, flying his Calidus um, uh, displays. And uh, I can't think of his name now. No, I said it, but anyway. Uh, he was the importer and he had the two-seater, but of course he sold so many that the, the, the demand for time of him in the two-seater was beyond the availability and eventually people get bored and try to have a go on their own or were kind of, I'm not, I wouldn't want to say they were forced or pushed to go solo sooner than they really wanted to, but probably that was the case. And uh, people paid with their life. And this is a little bit of colour from Dennis Fetters himself that he recounts the story where the CAA contacted him and say, had you approved the five hour training course that the distributor was giving? And he said, no, that's not enough. But of course, what, what that reflects is uh, how the importer in the UK, part of the deal when you bought one was a five hour training course in the two seater. And of course, you know, if you wanted more, you'd have to pay more, but probably that wasn't the forefront of people's mind, they thought, well, I'll probably be okay. And of course, uh, they weren't. So, Glasgow University report comes from that. One of the interesting things, I'm just gonna fast forward a few things, so I'm conscious that time's marching on and I wanna to get to today. The interesting thing from the Glasgow report is when they looked at Air Command, what they said was that actually, any difficulty for the pilot with the air command was likely due to lack of currency, recency or experience. And that the stability of these things was not dissimilar to unaugmented helicopters, i.e. helicopters without any sophisticated uh, assistance for stability for the pilot. So, you know, we can't be surprised when, well, I don't think we can be surprised when pilots with single digits that are going off solo every now and again come a cropper. Uh, you know, I think it's 
I think it should be fairly obvious to, to most. The other thing, interestingly, they mentioned the pump action stick. And although it might, might sound like uh, the benefit of hindsight in 2020, genuinely, when you look at some of these things, they don't look right. And I want you to remember that kind of sentiment when I talk later about the snags that occur with modern gyroplanes, because particularly for you guys in the US, and, uh, and I don't mean to be, I don't mean to be the arrogant Brit, and I know it's easy to always be labeled an arrogant Brit, mainly because we probably are. Brexit didn't help us, did it really? But anyway, uh, moving on. Thankfully, you've got Donald Trump, balance the scales. But look, <laughs> the problem for the US is that the aircraft that you're now, or the aircraft that are now becoming popular, I see it lights up straight away. Straight away, I guarantee some European giving me grief. No, no, just ha <laughs> ha. <laughs> so what <laughs> happy days good old banter so no what i'm going to say is in the uk because we've gone through this nonsense where you know we've had single seater accidents and later the raf 2000 didn't fare too well either we've had gyroplane fatalities the uk authorities have been very very restrictive and we can only fly realistically in the uk now auto gyro or magni product we can't do anything else and i don't foresee that changing anytime soon and in the us you've always had the freedom because look that's your you know that's in the dna of the constitution i imagine i'm not i'm no expert but you know you guys can literally do what you like and amen to that but now all of the newer aircraft that you guys are getting are the ones that we've been flying for for a long time now and one of the interesting things is, is that these aircraft, Magni and Autogyro products, they're not actually, they're not the greatest things in the sense that they've got huge uh, power yaw couple. So power changes make huge yaw changes. And which is why we have all of these uh, landing uh, and takeoff accidents. And I think that's coming. Oh, and, and certainly it's, it's already evident in some of the accident data that's from the US. And so what I mean to say is, when you see some of these snags that people, what, what, what I highlight and I have highlighted on the channel, and people are, it's very easy to go, well, that's not gonna be a problem, surely. How can that be a problem? You mark my words, that it's the little detail that trip you up. And we'll look at that uh, shortly. But before we do, the other big thing from the Glasgow University study uh, it wasn't, I don't think this is a revelation uh, to the world, but I think it for, probably formalized it rather than became new knowledge, but I certainly think it formalized it. This is an air command. And uh, if I fast forward, it's the same air command. Now you can see uh, the center line of thrust for prop. And if I do this, uh, this graphic shows broadly, I mean, this isn't being scientifically calculated, it's just for illustration. It shows you the C of G, shows you that the rotor thrust is gonna be opposing normally this stabilizing force. And if you take that away, what tends to happen is that because that propeller, uh, the thrust center line of the prop has got a lever to the C of G, it tends to you know, wind the, the nose of the aircraft down and that's how you depart control flight. So that's what's happening. Some of the remedies for, well, this is just showing some remedy for air command, although some other aircraft, particularly in the US, again, just because we don't, we're not allowed to fly anything really different in the, in the UK. Uh, they raise the undercarriage, which is just an idea just to, you know, raise the CRG and bring it closer to that uh, propeller center line of thrust. And also they put a, big old tailplane uh, on there. So that's what's going on there. There we go. Yeah, thanks for that, cool. Happy days. So, uh, lastly, before we get to where we're at now, the other aircraft that caused a lot of controversy in the UK was uh, RAF 2000. The big problem, and, I, and I'll just really fast forward to this because 
there's not really a lot of uh, RAF 2000 action these days. But you'll notice this is an early picture. No, there's a vertical stab, vertical stabilizer, no horizontal. <laughs> and now, this is a picture that was taken of a UK RAF 2000, probably within the last couple of years. Check out this horizontal stabilizer. It's literally, <laughs> it's enormous. And I'll just tell you the story of RAF 2000. Again, it's one of those mind boggling things similar to the pump action stick. So, the accident that caused them the biggest problem was there was a guy who had a heart attack. It was nothing to do with the aircraft at all. But because of the sensitivity in the UK at the time about gyroplane, they wanted to know all about the RAF 2000. So what they found was, and this is a ridiculous situation in my opinion, I mean, I'm, I don't understand it, but hey-ho. Uh, the RAF 2000 has got a trim wheel. So it's not a trimmer like uh, uh, an auto gyro, which is uh, on a coolie hat or, or a magni on a coolie hat. Uh, it's on a, on a wheel. But what they found was, from normal cruise, or you know, let's say climb out speed, 40, 50 miles an hour, to higher speed of 80 miles an hour, you'd need to retrim 50 turns, that's right, 50, five zero turns on the wheel. But the other problem was that the trim wheel was operated by your right hand. So normally you're flying around with your right hand on the stick, and then you need to retrim so now you've got to swap hands, wind this thing like Billy Ho, and then come back and they just said, look, that's ridiculous. So actually, the big thing with the stabilizer was nothing really to do with, uh, a lot of people think RF2000 stabilizer comes around from, you know, PIO. It isn't. The reason for that is to try and relieve some of the stick force and the need to retrim so much because obviously, with the, the wing at the back, provide some uh, you know, tr effect on, on the trim. So that's the RAF 2000 story. Finally, before we get up to date, I want to talk to you about the attitude of gyroplane pilots at the time. Uh, fundamentally, they were in large part out of control. Uh, you may be aware of a woman called Shirley Jennings, she writes some great books about gyroplane flight in the 1990s, uh, late 80s, early 90s. And this is an extract from her own book uh, called Spinning on the Wind. And, well, you can read it for yourself, but it basically says that, you know, people were just filling tires with bits of rags and grass. There was no checklist. There were no pre-flight inspections. And the thing that, the reason I'm including this in here is that Shirley Jennings has got a big hero uh, called uh, Chris Julian. And Chris Julian's dead. Chris would have been part of the group that she writes about in all of her, uh, her uh, literature. And Chris, uh, was actually, he was a professional speedway rider. He was a good guy and uh, he loved gyroplanes. But this is the kind of thing that he was all about. And Chris died in a gyro glider accident. And uh, the reason he died is because the entire rotor uh, came off. Uh, why? Because whoever had flown it before had done some modifications and hadn't replaced the bolts or, or rather the nuts for the bolts and the whole rotor head. Uh, departed on a flight that Chris was on and, 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 and you know, he was pulled to his death. And the reason I highlight this is because aviation accidents very often are not that complex in the sense that it's, you know, uh, some fantastical piece of engineering that's using space age material that's failed. Typically today, most accidents are the simple stupid things and if you get caught up in those accidents if you could be brought back to life and look back at your own mistake you know you'd be hanging your head thinking how on earth did I get caught out with something so stupid so 
the fundamentals, and this is what we're going to come to look at in a minute, the fundamentals are important. So where are we today? Well, this is a, um, a reflection of every gyroplane accident that's happened in the UK from uh, when factory built aircraft were first introduced in 2007 to 2017. And uh, basically 75% of all the accidents that take off and landing, they're, they're nothing particularly crazy in, in, in a way, you know, you, you, you read some of the devil of the detail of these accidents and you can barely believe that they happen. Um, it's quite embarrassing in some cases. A lot of low time pilots say, you know, you look at the, uh, you look at the data here on time on time and you've got, a, you've certainly got a lot of double digit hours, not triple digit. And uh, the, on the hours that are chunky, like here, 3,000, 2,000, and 1,500. Well, for example, they're going to be instructors that are on board. And, you know, one's had a bird strike, which is, you know, clearly that's just bad luck. Um, the accident that happened, sorry, the accident happened to, uh, to golf Oscar November, Oscar November. That was an RAF 2000. Uh, and that's had an engine failure. And that's, you know, a Subaru motor. So, you know, goodness knows what happened there. I'll just answer this little question. Uh, no, they're not fatalities. They're, um, no, they're not fatalities. In fact, uh, I know for fact all the fatalities here. Uh, there was, uh, let me try and find the accident that uh, was a fatality. There was a fat. Okay, forget the list. I'll tell you. Th th they are on there. I just, rather than me looking through, I may as well tell you. The very first accident that was fatal for a factory aircraft in the UK was in a Magni M24. Uh, the pilot was newly qualified. He took off and didn't close his door properly. Uh, once he was in the circuit or at circuit height, the door came open and he stopped, basically he stopped flying the aircraft and was wrestling with the door and lost control of the aircraft and, and died. Um, which is why if you fly a Magni M24, certainly in the UK, it's why there's a micro switch on the door now and you can't see the rotor RPM uh, if the door isn't closed properly. Problem, the, the unintended consequence of that is that the micro switch is a bit flaky. So that, that is a, a, you know, a perennial problem with those things. The other death there actually is, I know very well, uh, Golf Mike Echo Papa Uniforms, this one medical. Uh, that was my student, I'm afraid to say. Uh, terrible day. He uh, was literally uh, 30 minutes from finishing his entire course. He was booked in to do his uh, test with an examiner the following week. And he had a heart attack, they think, and he died. Uh, big, uh, a big thing. And I have to say, uh, personally, um, affected me in the sense that it it brought the it brought it home to me how um, you know you hear one minute you know I was having literally having a cup of tea and a bacon sandwich with this guy and giving him a briefing and then you know within ten minutes the guy was because he crashed on the runway in actual fact uh, I was one of the first people on the scene and he was done for. And in those moments when you don't know for certain what the problem really is, you know, you're thinking, well, has the aircraft failed? Did I tell him something wrong? And blah, blah. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big thing. So, you know, look, uh, in the end, the guy, I guess, in some ways died doing what he wanted to do. And, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't nice. So, and, and in some ways, one of the things that it's one of the things that it has tainted me with is that there's a lot of guys that there's a lot of good, yeah that's that's cool don't uh, Roger it's, it, you know it's it's it, it, it happens um, one of the things that you get to realise is a lot of especially older guys and I don't know what it is about gyroplanes they do attract older guys I mean that guy was uh, nearly eighty and uh, you know there's a lot of people in aviation that say oh don't worry about the medical 
I don't care. It's only me. And if I die, I don't care. Well, actually, you do. Uh, you should care. And the reason is that, for example, the tragedy of the accident for that happened to my student, it, although he was old, uh, his, his wife, he was with his wife, and their son had died in a motorbike accident uh, 30 years before. So all I could think of when, you know, I was looking at Richard, that was his name, Richard Green. I was looking at he was dead on the runway in front of me. And all I could think was at this point in time, only me and the other guy in the tower know that this guy's dead. You know, his wife's doing the shopping, happy, going around the business. And in an hour or two, police or whatever are going to call and just turn this uh, woman's uh, life upside down. So the message really from that is that if you do think that you're being clever by not being serious with a medical, maybe you don't care, but for sure, you know, there's probably others in, in, in your universe that, that, that do. Anyway, moving on. Why do I think we have all these takeoff and uh, landing accidents? I'll just answer, uh, yeah. So why do I think we have them? I think we have them for a variety of reasons predominantly. The first thing is, in mature aviation countries, and so that means Europe, basically, uh, I guess Australia, uh, although I'm not very familiar with, but you know, the Commonwealth countries and so on are gonna be effectively the same as Europe, and the US, definitely. We have become a minority to the point that no one cares anymore. The CAA, the FAA, they'll see gyroplanes as just an inconvenience, really. And, and then that sounds disparaging to the regulator, but when they're managing big airlines and sophisticated technologies, like is coming in now, where I guess a lot of their focus is distracted with things like autonomous vehicles, a gyroplane and a guy doing a home build is gonna be a pain in the ass. And so they don't own it. The other associations that used to historically own things like, for example, the PRA in the US or in the UK, the BRA, and I'm not familiar with the other countries, but certainly if I reflect what happens in the UK, the BRA, the British Rotorcraft Association, that doesn't really exist in any meaningful form anymore. It does exist, but no one cares. You know, there's no teeth in that organization. And certainly they wouldn't own things like, uh, you know, pilot training syllabuses or provide any real meaningful information to manufacturers about their documentation. And one of the things that frustrates me with this lack of ownership is that what, what, what ends up happening is it's the instructors and the examiners at the coalface that are typically the ones trying to make things happen, but they get along to get along. And if I reflect what's happening with modern gyroplanes, in the UK, the dominant force is uh, gyrocopter experience and a guy called Phil Harwood. Uh, and he's trying to migrate his stuff over to the States because clearly that's a big market. And it's not helpful because what happens is people don't want to criticize because of course, when one guy or one faction is dominant, you criticize that and then you become the outlier and then you become the target and easy to be, you know, trying to be trodden on. And, that, and I think that is a situation that we, that we have today. The other thing that is a problem is poor data and poor documentation. So what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, uh, poor data, you know, there's been very few real aerodynamic uh, studies done into gyroplane uh, or gyrocopter flight by hard-hitting scientists. Um, you know, the Glasgow University, we, we did, but actually they made a mistake because there was some fundamental error in the reference uh, point that they made to the Magni M16 that they were using, which meant that they didn't think that uh, a, a horizontal tailplane was useful. There's actually a new study that's being done by a university 
which remedy is that which hasn't been published because some of the data is embargoed by the CAA, but I think that'll be out later this year, but that will clarify that actually uh, a, a tailplane is affected. So there's been poor data, but some of the documentation around, I'm gonna show you something here. So I'm coming back to me just so I can get a different, uh, a different document up. Some of the data is just utterly dismal. So if I go to this, here you go. So this is the extra, it's an extract of an ELA pilot operator's handbook. It's for something called the ELA 07. Uh, for those not familiar, an ELA 07 is basically, uh, it's like a M16 autogyro sport. You know, it's an open, open tandem uh, aircraft. Now imagine, I'm a relatively new pilot and I'm used to flying off my own tarmac airfield, uh, which is, you know, it's got a mile, mile of runway, mile of tarmac, unchallenging, and it doesn't matter whether it's an ISA day, i.e. 15 degrees and sea level, or 30 degrees and 8,000 feet, you're going to get a gyroplane off a one mile tarmac runway. Okay, now we're in an ELA 07, and we've gone to a grass strip, which is 500 meters. I've got my wife <clears throat> full of fuel, and, uh, you know, it's a hot day. What am I going to do? I mean, literally, what am I going to do? Because even for my home airfield, this data is fundamentally junk. And, and, and I cannot believe that, I've got to be honest, I can't believe that this is the kind of data that a company is happy to produce. It says, takeoff distance, then it puts brackets roll. So clearly, it isn't the takeoff distance, because takeoff distance we should really be reinforcing is to clear 50 feet and it's saying somewhere between 330 feet or 230 feet depending on whether you've got uh, a 912 or a big 914 motor and that's good to man or beast that is absolute it's an embarrassment and um you know i i you'll you'll know because um i banged the drum on the channel uh, before about this you'll, you'll know that even the auto gyro uh which has got some more data right it's got a conversion for what you should do if it's hot and high uh and it has got a little bit more granularity to the to the takeoff data and it is to clear 50 feet but it's just it's pitiful and and how these documents of past airworthiness departments of various regulators I've got no idea. I mean, you know, it's easy to pigeonhole, you know, the Spanish as lazy Spanish. I mean, that's terribly racist. But, you know, you've got to, you've got to say that's, that's laziness right there. And it's because, you know, there's no organisation banging the drum. And, and don't get me wrong, the instructors in Spain are never going to criticise the ELA. Why? Because the ELA aircraft is probably the thing that your instructor flies. And now you've got the guy banging the drum saying your documentation is drunk what's he gonna is he gonna get spare parts for his aircraft now probably he will but it will be difficult and you know it's just he's just doing himself no favors so so the documentation is poor absolutely poor the other thing is is that although the maximum all at weight well first of all initially we we're at 450 kilos and you know look i'll stand up i'm a i'm a regularly you know i'm kind of an average average guy uh i'm five foot five foot nine normally six foot five if i speak to women um but uh 80 kilos which is what's that in pounds about 170 pounds i guess but um you know i think i'm relatively light you know certainly when i walk around uh you know some guys especially younger guys guys who are in their 30s there's some proper 
big old units. And you have two guys that are 100 kilos. Well, well they can't fly together. And, and what's happened is even though uh, the maximum all at weight has gone from 450 to 560, yeah, it has, but by the same token, some of these aircraft are massively heavy. I mean, for example, uh, Autogyro Cavalon with a 915, with any kind of a spec, they're getting up to nearly 320, 330 kilos. Well, you just put some fuel in it, and now you've got just as little capability for people as you did when it was at 450. Actually, a Cavalon's never been at 450, but, but, but you take my point. The other thing is differences training. Uh, now, um, differences training is, is, is one of those things that uh, in the US you don't, have the, you don't have the requirement for differences training. And I'm just gonna give you uh, an example here of where that uh, snagged people. Now, this is interesting actually, let me, uh, let me share this with you. So you can all see that. So this is an accident to November 882 Mike. Uh, it was a Cavalon. Thankfully the pilot was okay ultimately. It was a 915 uh, engined Cavalon. And when this first got reported that this thing had got smashed up, everyone jumped on the predictable bandwagon oh it's a blade flap and the reason they did that is because the ntsb report talks about the fact that he used the word rotated at 55 knots and, and anytime anybody says oh rotated they go oh that's a fixed wing term it's not a, he's not flying like a gyro pilot he's a filthy fixed wing pilot and he's trying to rotate and that's what that's all they focus on but actual fact one of the things that's interesting for the NTSB, and I don't know whether you, you guys are all aware of this, but I find it interesting. I found this out recently. Because the US is very open, uh, at the bottom they've got this thing called an investigation docket. And what that is, is if you click on that, you get the actual documentation that the pilot himself submitted. Now, the NTSB report isn't actually that helpful because what it does is that they've basically tried to summarize what the pilot said and because nobody in the NTSB flies a gyroplane, they've got no idea what's important or not important to the average guy. So, for example, at no point here, literally at no point here, do they talk about differences training. They don't say it. Nothing at all. There's literally no information about the fact that this guy had not flown with a 915 engine in his Cavalon before. However, let's have a look at what is in the docket. So back to my gormless face and back to the pilot report. It's quite good this uh, Zoom, isn't it really? Of the US invention. Probably the Brits invented it, but gifted it somehow for free to America. Oh, hang on, let's get this. We're talking nonsense. There you go. So this is what the pilot... <laughs> I can see it's lit up, look, the banter, the banter started. The banter. So, now one other thing you can tell about, and I can rip this guy a little bit. Just, so I'm just gonna move, because my back is killing me, so I'm bent over. It's like he's, he's dragged the spider across the page here. The, the, the quality of writing in America, dear, oh dear. I can tell you he's from Utah, anyway. He's well. This is just some basic information. And then we'll get his narrative. And the narrative is quite interesting. Now I can tell you because I, I've got quite a lot of hours actually on a Cavalon with a 915. They go like, they go like stink. They are pretty impressive. 915 engine in, a, in, a, in any gyro plane is the engine to have. It, it goes well. It really does go well. So this is just basic data about you know, what happened, as in, you know, where he was, uh, all the rest of it. But this is the, this is the narrative. And in the narrative, it talks about the fact that it was a new experimental plane had been successfully tested by a different test pilot for 13 and a half hours. The engine had 130 horsepower, which is 915. And the test pilot 
in the crash had only flown a 100 horsepower engine, uh, which is here. So it's basically, what it's saying is, this guy had only flown a Cavalon with a 912, and now he's upgraded to a 915. Well, I can tell you for fact, a Cavalon with a 912 is the, well, it's the aeronautical equivalent of an asthmatic pulling some heavy object uphill on a hot day with heavy pollen count. They are absolutely gutless. They're the most gutless thing in the world. But with a 915, boy, do you get going. And what's happened? He's basically, he's used the term rotated. And he's used the term, I've rotated at VY, blah, blah, blah. And that's just because he's just tried to, I don't read anything into that. I just think he's tried to use some aeronautical language to, to sort of say that or show that he's kind of on the ball. But basically the aircraft's unstuck and then it's yawed left. And uh, he thought it was rudder failure, but he now, he suggests it's the P factor. And P factor, without getting too complicated, or for that matter, and more importantly, without embarrassing myself in case there's real scientists in the room, but basically it's the torque effect uh, of a rotating device, uh, the gyroscopic precession. So for example, if you remember, you've got a bicycle wheel and you hold it at the spindle and then try and you know, raise it above your head, it fires off uh, 90 degrees, doesn't it? And that's, that's what it's trying to say here, this P factor. Excuse me, um, <laughs> I've just got to let my cat out because he's coming through the cat flap and now he wants to go. Okay. So, uh, he's basically yawed. Now, interestingly, from the pilot narrative, and this is what is not reflected at all in the NTSB report, he says that he feared returning to the runway in case he was going to, you know, land uh, effectively asymmetrically and, 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 and roll. So he's now tried to climb away. But he says that the plane was behind the power curve and wouldn't climb or gain airspeed. Well, I can tell you, if you struggle to climb away with a 915 on full throttle, then you've got some pitch. I mean, you are literally looking at the moon. So I think what's happened is fundamentally, he hasn't had any differences training and he's got no experience. Now bearing in mind a Cavalon's a two-seater, that's fairly unforgivable actually. But he's got caught out. I think he's over-rotated and ended up nose high. And he's had a lot of yaw. He hasn't got enough boot in. And the rest of the actual accident is because he's tried to force it off the ground. You know, he's got way too nose high. He's behind what I call the drag curve. A lot of guys call the power curve. And he's sunk back onto the runway and the things roll over. And, and that for me is, is starts and finishes at the fact that he just did not have uh, differences training. Uh, no, it was the yellow one. I think it was the, um, I've covered it actually on my channel. Um, it was, it was, it was, I think he, I think it was a yellow one. I think it was a yellow, uh, no, 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 not a yellow one. It was a white one, a white Cavalon, I think, with blue, blue flashes. Normally, if you look on, uh, if you're on Google, if you go on Google, or if you go on Google and uh, Google 882 uh, Mike, you, you'll see. I think normally the picture of it I see is kind of early dusk uh, with some emergency services. But, uh, but you know, the, the, the thing that's interesting, uh, sorry, let me just go back to the, let me just go back to the, the pilot narrative. Because this is the thing that's the, 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 the and this for me, I, don't, I just don't get where the NTSB, where they're, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not being uh, anti-NTSB, the AIB in, in the UK equally, to, to, you know, remiss in, in this regard. He says himself, look, this pilot says, pilots should be checked out in flight by another experienced pilot. It's like, well, it's a shame that you came to that re realization after the fact, but at least you did. 
quite why the NTSB haven't fed. I mean, for me, the only sensible thing the NTSB could have done in that situation is to have made a recommendation and to wholeheartedly agree with that recommendation from the pilot and, and make it something more formal for the US. But, but, but you know, it hasn't. And, and mark my words, that's, for me, one of the things that um, is going to catch a lot of people out in, in, in the future. And um, in the UK, it's not particularly great in the sense that we do have a formal requirement for differences training, but the instructors uh, only ever have to have flown that gyroplane once, and, it, and they may never fly it again for 10 years, and they'll still have the ability to conduct differences training, which is ridiculous. But the other element that I think is highly contributory to these takeoff and landing accidents uh, is some of the way, one thing, I'll, I'll just finish my thing, Charles. I yeah, the other thing I think is human factors, and it's to do with the rate of change of some of the training advice. And this is where I come on to next. And I think you guys in the States are at risk of having this uh, become more prevalent than maybe it is right now. Uh, sorry, you said on one, so Charles asking me, you've said on your videos, the stick may have been too far back. Uh, he should have pushed one fist forward. Yeah, okay, so, so what, okay, so I'll come on to that. Yeah, I'll come on to that, Charles. But ba basically, look, one of the problems, and this, okay, so we'll, we'll talk about it right now. One of the real problems with uh, some of the way that modern gyroplanes are being instructed is that a lot of the instructors are legacy guys from, you know, from, from single seat days. And if you fly a single seater, the, the, the point of this wheel balance is obviously a necessary uh, part of the takeoff process and part of the training. Because if you fly a single seater, uh, you are necessarily on your own the very first time you fly it because you're not there's no two seat element so the last thing that the instructor wants when he's instructing the pilot that's just about to go on his own in a single seater he doesn't want the guy to end up being hundreds of feet in the air he wants the guy to build up to these things slowly and in a manageable way and feeling his way forward because that's the only safe way to do it. But in a two-seater, if you were the guy with the Cavalon 915 pilot, you, you don't care if the very first takeoff, the guy is 10,000 feet in the air because you're a qualified pilot and you're sat right next to him, connected by the aircraft. And at any point you can say, I have control. And so, what I said in the video about that accident for 882 Mike, I think it was, I think he over-rotated. And this is a very common uh, issue with modern gyroplanes, especially auto gyro uh, brand uh, gyroplanes because they've got a keel which has got a big crank keel at the rear. And what that allows is that as you, if, so this is my gyroplane, as I start to, we'll use the term rotate, but as you get into either a wheel balance or the takeoff attitude, because you've got, it's not a straight keel. If it was a straight keel, you can only, you can only get that pitch attitude before the tail is now on the, on the, on the runway. With a cramped keel, you know, I can get almost, well, if you get um, an auto gyro, if you, if, you, if you have one at your flying club and just stand it on the tail, you know, the nose is like 40 degrees nose up. Uh, and that obviously becomes quite disconcerting if you're a low time pilot. The other thing is because the reason that it's gone so far uh, nose high is because you've got a lot of backstick. And so now you generate, if you think back to the lift equation, you've got less you, you need less airspeed with more angle of attack so you've got a lot of angle of attack which means the thing will rotate for want of a better word at a lower speed so now when it unsticks none of the aerodynamic 
you know, the horizontal tailplane's not working, you've got no acceleration, you're just in this dead area where you've got massive nose high, no acceleration, no speed. The thing just literally, you know, it's like almost torque rolls on itself and it's just a horrible thing. And, and because that's even more draggy, there's a real danger the thing sinks back, but now it sinks back on the deck and you're sort of, you know, pointing 45 degrees, you know, that guy said he was 45 degrees, you ought to the left. Uh, and, it, and it just digs in and rolls. And that's, that's just one problem of this over-rotation. So, but the other issue is, as, the, as I'm trying to highlight with this diagram around human factors. Now, most people are not making mistakes intentionally. So they're not going down the intended actions violations, i.e. they're not being reckless. And neither are they making mistakes because someone's told them something that is fundamentally wrong. What they're doing is they're trying to do the right thing, but the right thing is too complex, or they haven't devoted enough attention to it, or they've misapplied the right thing. You know, they think they're doing the right thing when actually they're doing the, the wrong thing. And largely, this is something that someone sent me, and it's about, it's, it's an extract from the Phil Harwood IAPGT. Some of you that follow his mythology, uh, sorry, I say mythology, I mean methodology, uh, slip of the tongue, um, will be familiar with some of this. The problem, okay, so in some ways, his ambition is noble in the sense that his philosophy is if you have a training model and you keep refining and refining and refining and refining eventually you get the best that can be but as anyone that may know that's been in industry in a manufacturing capability or maybe in an it uh, function and in the past for example this picture in the back by the way that that's me at Le Mans 24 hour i used to be a professional race driver and of course at some point, you've got to fix on what you've got. You can't keep refining forever because in motor racing, the event is going to happen. You know, the race day is going to come tomorrow and we run out of time. In, and in industry, you've got to produce. Look, the iPhone's not a perfect solution, but they're selling this because they want to bring something to market. And likewise, in a basic flying course, you've got to present somebody with a coherent set of actions that can be the average guy can perform consistently well to to give you a, an outcome that 99 percent of the time is going to be successful and what's happened with harwood in in my opinion he's, he's lost himself um he's just lost himself and if you read his books for example so the latest book and i think he published one maybe a year or two ago that wouldn't, the, the content of that book for this part of the takeoff process, uh, you wouldn't recognize because it's changed even in a year. And, and if you look at the complication here, it's just ridiculous. And for me, the other element of, of and I think this is where this starts to become dangerous. This down here where he talks about initial power setting and takeoff power setting, the, the motivation for those elements are to make that wheel balance uh, more manageable. And so you don't get that over rotation that I described earlier. And so because he's compromising for that reason, you compromise the takeoff. And why do you compromise the takeoff? Well, because now if we think about the fact that our process is always to use power for takeoff which is anything less than 100 percent how does that then translate when we're at an airfield where we need performance and the reality is it doesn't so when you look at all of the takeoff performance data in pohs naturally that's going to be at full power so if you're not using full power you're never going to achieve that data and also if you need the comfort of 
part power for takeoffs. Well, look, I know some of you in the room, I know one guy in the room because I've checked the, the, the registration. I know he flies with Andy Jones at Chilton Park. Now, Andy Jones is a lovely guy, but Andy Jones at Ch Chilton Park, for those who don't know, it's a grass airfield uh, in the middle of England. Uh, it's probably about 700 meters, I would say. Uh, it's pretty good airfield, the, 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 main, the main runway, and, and that's fine. And you're going to get off that nine times out of ten, solo, or even two up, without a lot of trouble. But you go to some airfields, and bear in mind, you know, gyroplanes are built for people that want to do a little bit of an adventure. And half of the time, we go to an airfield that might be 500 meters. I'll guarantee that the methodology when you use something like this, when you're two up on a hotter day on a 500 meter strip, you are, you're going to end in the boundary fence for sure. There's no question of any doubt you're going to end up in the boundary fence. And, and so many do. So that's why for me, you, if you uh, regular viewers of the channel, you'd have seen, I have a, a view of a takeoff technique. People don't like that. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of talking over th the reality. I think we need better data, better documentation, a consistently trained technique to clear 50 feet. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute because uh, let, me, let me just stop this and show you something else. Um, sorry. I wanted to show you this and share that screen with you. Boom. Right, okay, here you go. So, my focus, if you look to the channel, and I won't go into detail of the technique, you can, it's easier just to watch the, the, the YouTube channel. The big people that throw their arms up around my going forward a fist on the stick, uh, to get airborne. That technique, everybody says, oh, you're going to sail the blades. You're going to sail the blades, man. It's going to end up like this guy here with his calibers. And, uh, and I can tell you it won't. Uh, and it won't because I use a technique that I promote every time I go flying a gyroplane. And I've got nearly 2,000 hours in a gyroplane, and that's never happened. Why has it happened? Well, it hasn't happened because if you do the technique correctly, it can't happen. Because my technique, so let's just, let's just go back to, let's just go back to the technique, which is a common one. And it's coming, and I know a lot of you in the US, but this, this, this kind of stuff's gonna be forced upon you soon by your CFIs because the main uh, guy from Autogyro USA, he uh, uses this stuff. And it's fine, it's gonna work until it doesn't. The first thing is, it's a massively complicated faff to say, release the pre-rotator and pull the stick back and blah, 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 power to initial and all the rest of it. The problem is, if you go on YouTube and look at the, 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 the dealer for Autogyro in New York, He's a young kid by the looks of it. He puts a few videos on. I can't remember the company, but uh, he's made a film and it's called Flying During Coronavirus. And he's relieved his boredom. He flies by this methodology where one release of pre rotator. And he, what he does, he, you get into the music of saying, oh, one release of pre rotator, two do this, three do that, without actually thinking cognizantly of what you're what actually doing. All you're doing is singing to yourself. And that's what this guy does. And actually he takes off using this method, but actually he doesn't follow the method in the POH because he's pre-rotated to 300. And actually if you pre-rotate the 300 in autogyro, you don't bring the stick all the way back. You actually just bring the stick back a little bit and you can read the POH for confirmation. But so the problem is, you get into the music rather than thinking about what you're doing. What you need to do is realize that, look, of course you're going to release the pre-rotator when you pull the stick back. And actually in an auto gyro, it doesn't matter because the pre-rotator is on a micro switch. And even if you pull the stick back with the pre-rotator button pressed, the pre-rotator is not going to be pre-rotating. 
because the micro switch is disengaged. But that's a natural default. So don't clutter the brain saying things that are obvious. It's like when you start the uh, when you start the ground roll, don't talk about releasing the wheel brake. Just say start the ground roll. Obviously, you're going to release the wheel brake when you start the ground roll because otherwise, no, no kidding, you're not going to check. You're not going to be uh, starting the uh, starting the ground roll. Uh, ah, okay, that's very interesting, actually. Uh, whoever talked. To, so, so the guy. Sorry, I don't know if you can see it. But the guy who's talking with Andy. He said he taught the fist forward. And the reason I say that's interesting uh, is that he, <laughs> he, he had a big moan up actually with one of the students that he examined of mine about the, the takeoff. So that is in, that's an interesting, was that, was that recent, can I ask you, Marlo, if that was uh, recent when he did that? I guess not because of the corona, but anyway. Uh, tell, me, tell me later. So anyway, going back to what I was going to show you which was this callus that's all been spanned. The key to the whole technique, if you're gonna do this fist forward, is you've gotta monitor rotor RPMs. And I say that because this callus, what's happened? So the typical accident, and the, the way that this happens, if you just see me in the, in the side there, they start, so you pre-rotate, I've got my hand on the pre, look, I'm on the pre-rotate here with the thumb, oh, and the stick's all the way forward. I'm building rotor RPM. And I release the wheel brake to start, but I don't bring the stick back. I leave the stick forward. And now I'm rocketing off on the ground roll. Why am I rocketing off? Because I've got no rotor drag because the rotor is still flat. And I'm going forward at a rate of knots. And of course, at some point, I realize, oh, crikey, I've got the stick forward. What an idiot. I pull the stick back. And of course, what's happened? The rotor RPM has decayed. I pulled the stick back. And the rotor now, what happens is the dissymmetry of lift, the rotor tries to flap and it can't flap out enough. Uh, there's too much because the rotor, because basically your forward speed component is a bigger percentage of the, than the rotational velocity and it can't flap out enough uh, of the angle of attack necessary to equalize the lift left and right and the rotor clatters the, clatters the teeter stops, that wrenches the stick out of the hand. And at the same time, because now you, do, you don't have enough flapping effect to flap out the dissymmetry of lift, you now, roll, uh, you now roll over to the left. And that's what happens. That's the consequence. But if you look at the pilot assessment, and you can read this, I'll send you the link. I'll fast forward. But basically, at no point in any of this, does the guy say, oh yeah, I was looking at my rotor RPM and I noted it at decay uh, and I carried on anyway. All of these guys are completely oblivious to their rotor RPM. And so that is why if you follow the instructions off of my uh, video with regards to takeoff technique, you cannot sail the blades. And the process is a lot more simple than, I think here, look, we're only building rotor speed here, and we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. We've got 18 steps, and all we've done is build rotor speed. Well, no wonder people are, are, are overloaded. No, no, no one. So, I think we need a technique that uh, is focused on clearing 50 feet and not on uh, wheel balance, which definitely we're, we're at now. Uh, the syllabus changed to give a greater focus upon the takeoff and landing accidents, because look, we're not having accidents in gyroplanes from vertical descents. No one's doing a vertical descent and then hitting the ground. There's very few people crashing because of engine failure anymore. And there's no one crashing, particularly on rough fields. You know, in the UK, we have a whole thing on rough field takeoff and advanced pre-rotation and slow rotor build-up. No one's crashing because of that. They're crashing on straightforward, everyday commoner garden, takeoff and landing. And that's the area that we should be focused on. So the other element I've, we talked about already about differences training. And then also, for me, I would also look at where we revalidate. So 
In the UK, for example, we have to revalidate our license every two years, but it's only because we do 12 hours in the second year, which for me, I don't think it's enough. I think we should revalidate uh, yearly. And I think if I was a private pilot, not flying that much, I'd probably seek uh, instruction of some sort or guidance from an instructor uh, on a yearly basis. So better piloting techniques we've touched on uh, on the takeoff side, and you can see the video. On the landing side, it's all about managing your and drift, which is uh, technique for sure, but also a lot of pilots are not, they've not got into a trim regime on the final approach. You know, they're not trimmed. Uh, one of the videos I've got on the channel is of a German pilot in an M24. You watch those films, not once does he chat, not once does he trim on final approach. Ironically, he got in contact with me because I used his video. And, uh, and incredibly, he said, I've never been taught to trim on final approach. I was staggered, but there you go. And okay, you don't know what you don't know, but you need to trim and you need to make your approach speed consistent. I also, I'm not a particular big fan of what I call from the helicopter world, a zero, zero landing. A lot of guys think it's very Gucci to arrive on final approach and land, and then that becomes, you know, there's no ground roll. It looks quite flash, but I can tell you, it doesn't leave you with very many options. You know, if you, if you round out high, you're just gonna come down with a clatter. Uh, and if you're not accurate in your or drift, you've not got a lot of uh, options left to adjust in the final phase. So what I would always say is, fly final approach is around 70 miles an hour, to about 65 knots, and which for some people is fast. And then be happy with some element of float um be happy with some element of float uh once you've got the round out and, and and just be comfortable there the people who are not comfortable there are, are typically people that are not good at managing the yaw and, and, and drift uh, the other thing is don't get suckered into this fly like a gyroplane pilot mentality where you approach to land not on final approach because at some point you're going to either hit something on the undershoot or if you have to go around, you're going to hit something uh, on the overshoot. It's, a, it's quite a dangerous, silly thing to do really at, at most airports. Just, just get yourself competent at flying. Um, and, you know, if you have to deal with a crosswind, just, be, just, just have a better technique. The other thing is airmanship and, and, uh, and, and, and basic fundamentals around safety. And I want to share with you uh, just a couple of things. In fact, before I do that, where am I? Uh, here I am. I'll just cover these two things in, in one go, actually, because it will make it easier. So airmanship and safety, and then the modern, it's a relatively modern phenomenon around GPS, radio, and some navigation. So let me just show you something here, which I'm going to share with you. And that is, where is it, where is it, where is it? Uh, oh yes. So, when this accident happened, a lot of people said, and, and if you remember to one of the earlier comments I made, they said, oh, you know, if it could happen to John Judge in a Ken Wallace aircraft, it could, it could happen to anyone. And, and when Chris Lord got killed in a Cavalon at Sebring, there were a lot of people that said, oh, if it can happen to Chris Lord, it can happen to me. Uh, now, I don't want to sound arrogant, uh, but I can tell you that this accident could never have happened to me. And I'd like to think that everybody in the room, it will never happen to you either. Because what Chris Lord's done here, I've honestly got no idea. I mean, I've genuinely got no idea. I know it's... You know, it's a bit, um, it's a bit, what's the word? It, it's not very, uh, it's not very gentlemanly to, to criticise someone given what's happened. But I've got to say, you, you, you just got to call it how you see it. So for those who do know, or for those that don't know, I'll just give you a basic outline. But uh, So this Cavalon 
has been put together by Cloud9 in Florida. And ironically, I instructed, would you believe, one of their helicopter instructors from Cloud9 did his gyroplane test with me in England. So there you go. It's, it's amazing how small uh, an industry this thing is. So Cloud9 have put together uh, this uh, gyrocopter in, uh, in the States for the original customer. And for some reason, when uh, the thing was put together and then gone through the fly-off process, and for those that don't know, in the States, the first 40 hours of these aircraft have to be flown uh, by an instructor or the owner, I believe, uh, before they can then get their sort of airworthiness finally ticked off because obviously they're experimental aircraft and what they don't want is for you to be taking your wife and kid in, a, in this experimental thing where it's untested. So during that test phase, uh, the original pilot, and I'll just fast forward in through some of the some of the data here just to get to the relevant bit i'll send you a, a link later but basically uh the original pilot said and it's down here the test pilot stated that he grounded the gyroplane after something like 16 hours because of improperly rigged flight controls and he said he'd not fly the gyroplane again until it was fixed so He's had enough and said, I'm not flying this thing anymore. At some point subsequent, the, the owner of the aircraft had had enough and wanted to sell it. Now, Chris Lord was the chief operating officer of Autogyro USA. Now, I'm not sure whether he bought the aircraft for Autogyro USA or for himself and thought, mm, you know, this has come up at a good price. I'm going to buy it. But Chris Lord has ended up picking this aircraft up from Cloud9, uh, North, Palm, North Palm Beach Airport. And when he's got there, he himself is a little bit suspicious because suddenly this thing, having been grounded apparently, it's now got 40 hours, so all that fly-off process has been done. But what he says is he, he know, he's basically flown this thing back from North Palm Beach to Sebring, and he's noted that there's car... The carbs are leaking, which in fairness is, I mean, I don't know how, you know, how, what's a leak? You know, is it a leak, a little bit of a weep, or is it literally running out? I don't know. But anyway, it's a bit of a carb leak. The airspeed indicator doesn't work. And then you can see here, he says, he sent a text back to the president of Autogyro USA, and he said, I can mix eggs with the control stick, and I can see how rough this thing's been put back together. But... Apparently, the aircraft was due to be at an air show two days later. And so the following day, he's trying to fix the, he's trying to get these rotors balanced. Uh, he rejects the offer of Autogyro USA to ship the actual proper rotor balancing equipment. And he's trying to do it with trial and error. And subsequently, it would seem that he's not been particularly successful because the NTSB concludes that what actually happens, the reason this thing crashes is because the rotor of vibration, they believe, is going to be so extreme, it effectively vibrates the nut off the other end of the control uh, rod, uh, not rod, cable. Uh, in a cavalry, it's control cables. It's like a, what they call a teleflex cable. And at the other end, the, the, the nut that secures the, that control cable to the stick disappears so now the sticks just not controlling the rotor and you know inevitably you know you can imagine the thing crashes now quite why quite why chris uh given uh the level of his experience has put himself uh well without being a little bit too arrogant he's not only killed himself but unfortunately uh, he had a passenger which was another guy that, because the accident um, happened, transporting this other guy back to his home airfield and they crashed en route. So he's not only killed himself, but he's killed another guy in this, in this frankly, idiocy. Um, and, and I can say, that would never happen to me because you, as pilots, if you ever fly these things, if, you, if there's ever a doubt, then there is no doubt. You don't fly. You seek proper advice, you get it fixed, 
because these aircraft, they're not organic. They don't, they don't heal themselves. Unless you actively do something, they're going to have the same problem. And, you know, the guy was flying at 90 knots, which is near, actually near VNE. And in my opinion, a little bit like we reflected in the 1990s with uh, Chris Julian. At some point, you know, you roll the dice and, and it doesn't come up the way that you uh, want it to, to come up. And unfortunately, with aviation, you tend to only have one accident before you're done with. I just want to give you another couple of examples of where people probably uh, should have known better, could have done better. Certainly, I think it's a training issue. This one's a, an autogyro sport, crashed in Texas. And uh, this is how it ended up. A right old mess. I think the pilot, I think he sprained a wrist or fractured a wrist. And I think his wife, who was in the back seat, broke her, broke her arm. Uh, now, I'm not from America, you can probably tell. And I'm not particularly familiar with all of the terrain but it would seem a lot less populated than Europe and one of the dangers here without trying to be too dramatic is that of course if you're actually hurt in these kind of instances you could be lost for some time before help ever arrives and uh, and on the basis broken his wife's arm I, I doubt very much whether they're enjoying uh, twilight flights into their old age anymore. But look why it happened. It happened because he'd taken off from his own ranch and he was on, on his way to a, a licensed airfield. And en route, his electronic tablet failed. So he's landed at someone else's ranch. And these, these ranches, by the way, they must be quite impressive actually. They must be some oil magnate, I suppose. Anyway, uh, he's fixed his problem. But then he's taken off again and he's just literally fired it into the trees. Now, quite why? I mean, first of all, look, two things. First of all, if you have a problem with an electronic device because you're using GPS to navigate by, if that causes you to land because you cannot complete your flight without your GPS, well, shame on you because you should have a proper chart. And, I, and, and I've got to say, I fly mainly with GPS, of course I do. But I'm lucky enough in the UK, the UK is obviously a relatively small piece of real estate. And because I've flown a lot, normally where I'm going, I can pretty much fudge my way without any map or any GPS. But if I'm going somewhere where it is unfamiliar, I will genuinely take a chart. Now I may not primarily plan from the chart, but I have a chart with a line on it and a rough compass bearing so that, you know, I can pick up a main road or I can get some theme going in my head as to how I can get from A to B. What you don't want to do is be sticking it in a field uh, to fix your problem. And worst of all, you know, then making a complete horlix of the takeoff and firing it in the field and busting your wife up uh, in the process. The other kind of thing, that you want to be better at, in my opinion, is use of the radio. Or you want to get confident, confident with the radio such that it doesn't become overloading or distractional. And let me find, sorry, I'm faffing here, I can sense it. Let me find this, but there you go. So this is the other one. Now, this is only a prelim report because uh, they're in the middle of investigating this. But as this turns out, it's a Magni M16 accident that happened at a place called Cape Girardo in uh, Missouri. Now, this airport is some piece of airfield. I mean, for the Brits, this, this kind of airfield, this is like you go on holiday in a jet from this kind of airfield. The main runway is 6,500 feet long. And the secondary airfield, the second runway, is over 4,000. No, I think it is about 4,000 feet long. I think they were actually on the 4,000 feet runway, but bear in mind, it's 4,000 
4,000 feet of tar and a gyroplane, uh, you know, you could do multiple takeoffs and landings in one go. But what's happened here? These guys are doing touch and goes. Uh, they're in the circuit. One caution, as you know, if you watch the channel, I caution against doing touch and goes uh, without a plan of how many you're going to do because it's a very high, uh, you know, it's a very stressful thing to be doing. I wouldn't be doing more than three or four as a new pilot uh, before knocking on the head. And uh, I know one of the audience used to be one of my students and you, he'll know and would happily reflect, I'm not a big fan of touch and goes because a lot can go wrong and there's not much reward in actual fact. One of the problems with touch and goes is when you land, you're not reinforcing the full stop landing. You're reinforcing something that is only applicable to touch and goes. So for normal landings, what you do isn't what you do during a touch and go. Anyway, this guy been doing his touch and goes and when he's downwind, he's had an alarm with an oil, well, he thinks is an oil pressure alarm but he carries on. Not only does he carry on, he then, having touched down off that off that circuit, tries to do another, you know, go, you know, he tries to go again, only he smells something and he then feels that the engine's not making power, so he so he lands ahead. And having landed ahead, for some reason, he's landed ahead, but he's got in his mind, uh the instructor that was watching said he only had about 200 feet remaining. So, I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what's quite happened here that the guy's taken 3,800 feet to do one landing and then abort another la a takeoff effectively, but anyway. And then, because he then thinks he hasn't got enough room to maneuver and backtrack or get back to parking, he's tried to take off again, only this time he's just, made a complete shambles and, and landed in the mud beyond the runway. Now there's two things here. Training has got to be a training issue. I mean, I know it's a preliminary report, but I can't imagine that this ever becomes anything other than a training issue. Because number one, what kind of person is going solo in an aircraft and is happy to ignore what they think is an oil pressure alarm? You know, he, there you go, so he dismissed the engine light for oil pressure. Well, what kind of idiot thinks that it's cool to fly with the oil pressure alarm? I mean, it's remarkable. So, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, when you're an instructor and you've made a briefing, you know, you've briefed the student, haven't you? You said, look, what we're going to do, we're going to do some touch and goes, and I'll be on the radio. If you have any problems, call me on the radio. So first of all, the student didn't call him on the radio. But by the same token, the instructor didn't call the student. And bear in mind, the instructor has seen this guy land. He's then seen him abort. And at that point, surely the guy, the instructor gets on the radio and said, hey, is everything okay over there? You know, I see that you aborted that. Okay, knock it on the head, come back to parking or whatever, you know, give some instruction. But clearly that hasn't, uh, that hasn't happened. Uh, yeah, thanks, Scott. I'll uh, I'll send you a recording. So yeah, so that so that's for me is part of the you know the bigger picture is you know if you if you relate it all back to where we started with this and uh, the benefit of the benefit of hindsight, you got to think that in the end, it's just the doing the simple things well and consistently well that is going to look after you. And these gyroplanes are no more or less dangerous than any other form of aviation. Uh, you might have a view on whether a rotary wing aircraft is, you know, inherently more dangerous than a fixed wing aircraft. But in a sense, they're fundamentally robust pieces of equipment if you have them serviced and maintained properly. But what they're not is they're not idiot proof. And you can see when you look at these accidents, that either things like, you know, not planning your flight very well, so you need to land in a field, <clears throat> not understanding the takeoff distances that are required and, 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 and crashing into the boundary fence or the boundary trees, 
not being able to use the radio so then you get you know mentally overloaded or your fundamental process doesn't allow you to do those fundamentals well and one of the issues for me and that's where i come back to this whole thing about takeoff technique if you are, if you are performing a takeoff technique that it doesn't matter how well you do it is never going to produce the numbers that are in the poh then you need to see an instructor and what i mean to say by that i'm not an advocate of releasing the wheel brake and then just smashing the throttle all the way to full power initially in actual fact for most aircraft that isn't going to be beneficial anyway but i do think that by the time you are four or five seconds into the ground roll if you cannot get to full throttle because look if you choose not to get to full throttle because for whatever reason you know you want to give the engine an easy time and you've got six and a half thousand feet of cape Girardeau, well maybe that's what you want to do but for most people you should have the ability to get to full throttle so and why because it gives you even if you don't need it because you've got runway available you should do it because it gives you more options because you'll be a, you'll be higher sooner that if you do have an engine problem you know you don't want to have an engine problem at 100 feet because that's going to be more dramatic than you know you've got off the ground and and, and got on with it and then you've you know you're giving yourself options and that's the, the best thing okay that's kind of me done and <laughs> I can see that we've uh, I can see that we've overrun again, but hey ho. Uh, right, I've got a question here from Charles saying, "What kind of fault defined the engine?" Well, it would have been a well, it's Magni M16, so I could only imagine it was a 914 Rotax. Now, um, for me, with 914 Rotax, uh, they are. They're actually reasonably robust. I mean, all Rotax motors are pretty robust, um, especially if they're well maintained. And there's no reason to say uh, this one wasn't. I'm sure in the final report we'll we'll get an idea. But the point about that accident with November three one six Mike Golf was that the the student pilot, even though he was only a student, you know, he's landed the aircraft. You know, he's 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 landed. He's got away with whatever the engine problem was. He's got away with it. Because he's, he's completed his circuit and he's landed, but then he's decided he's going to take off again. But even then, he's thought, oh, actually, it feels a bit wrong. I'll land ahead. And, and, and for me, th there's two things at play here. The first is the poor decision making in deciding to take off for the second time. But beyond that, the fact that his instructor just hasn't got involved. You know, I don't know. I mean, I don't know the instructor. I think actually, well, I don't know him, but I'm led to believe the instructor is a very experienced instructor. I mean, it might be just something as simple as the instructor was on his phone. It's very easy, isn't it? Everyone's got these, and you know, his you know his wife's probably on the phone saying, uh, "When are you back for tea?" And in the meantime, all this is unfolded, and he's kind of just missed it. But who knows? Uh, okay. Could you review the no? The, could I review the fixed nose wheel versus the free no, nose wheel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. So, uh, what that's all about? That actually is a much bigger deal for you guys in the states than it is for us in Europe. And the only reason for that, and it's not, I don't, I don't, and I don't say that with any arrogance whatsoever. The only reason it's a bigger deal for you guys than it is for us is because we don't know any different. There's, there, there are no free nose wheel aircraft that I know of that are flying in, in the UK. So we are forced with that thing, and therefore, because by necessity, we have to get on with it, we kind of make do. The, the video that will help you if, if, uh, if, you, if you, well, you're gonna be forced the same way, because of course, if you fly a Magni or if you fly uh, an auto gyro, then you're gonna end up with a fixed nose wheel. So at some point, if that is a problem, you're gonna to have to get on top of it. But it basically relates to, and I'm trying to get my hands ready. Sorry, I've got my camera on the computer, so I have to try. So if you think about it, there's the runway here, and this is me coming down final approach. If I've got any kind of crosswind 
at some point I'm now not effect the wheels are not aligned because effectively I want to go that way as soon as I touch down the wheels want to go that way and it just means you cannot be lazy and and land uh, anything other than perfectly aligned with the way you want to go and of course because naturally you tend to land on the main gear all that you have to do is just hold the nose off uh, and let the energy run out and even if you have it even if you have ended with you know some rudder input to, to maintain direction and so the nose wheel is now a little bit canted off when it touches it's touching at such a low forward uh, rate of roll that it, it makes no real difference and um, if you look at if you look at some of that uh, on on the channel that I've done, you'll see that it's not it's not dramatic at all. But it does need you do need to be uh, cognizant of, of those things. Um, right, what another question here? Can you recommend a flight school in the US? Uh, Ron, a good question, and I'd like to, but I can't. I've got literally uh, no idea where. Whereabouts in the US are you from? Uh, is probably what I would probably do, uh, Ron, is <clears throat> go and look at something like the PRA uh, website. And I guess ge uh, you know, ge geography is probably a bigger driver for you in the States than it is in the UK, in the sense that, you know, for the UK, even if you travel the length and breadth of the country, you can do it in sort of three or four hours. Whereas, of course, that's not going to be the, ah, uh, the, the PRA has all this. And, okay, uh, then, then the other thing you could do is uh, go on to this, which is rotaryforum.com, I think, and, and ask there. The, 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 that's kind of a, that is, that, that forum <coughs> is definitely a US-centric, uh, forum and they'll have an idea there. Are uh, you in Massachusetts? Um, I don't. I, I don't know. I, 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 and, and actually, even if I could give you a name, because I'm, I'm aware that it exists, the quality of it, I've got no idea. But uh, someone, someone in the PRA, if you phone them up or went on that forum, uh, they'll give you a good steer, I'm sure. Cool. Uh, okay. Any more for any more, or have you had enough? of my chat. If we're all done, uh, I'm going to say goodbye. No, thank you for all attending and I very much appreciate uh, you spending uh, a couple of hours with me listening to my thoughts. Uh, if you've got any more thoughts, I'm always there on email and uh, you know, I appreciate you spending your money with me and uh, hopefully some of it's been useful, but sincerely, uh, I'm always here on email and you can always uh, get involved if you've got any questions. Uh, thanks Ronald, thanks Michael. Uh, when's the next one Michael's asking me? Um, you can probably see the chat, right? I guess all of you. Um, yeah, I don't know actually. Um, it, it, what, what would be good is if you could give me some subject matter that you would find interesting because obviously for me, well look, I've sat here now for what two hours and twenty minutes, just talking pretty much non-stop. I can, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite happy to talk about gyroplanes. I'm comfortable. It's a subject I'm fairly comfortable about. Um, but if you just give me an idea what you want to know, that would probably be nice for me because I feel that uh, I'm probably telling you something that you want to hear rather than, you know, me just talking to the to the wall because it's a bit of a weird thing here because uh, I can't see it, so I'm just talking to my screen, and I don't know, maybe it's what, uh, this is just a strange thing. Anyway, guys, thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate, that. I'll send, I've got all your email, give me probably till tomorrow. Um, what I'll do is I'll send you the presentation. Uh, you can look at it at your own um, leisure. And, and as I say, if you've got any questions, you know where I am, and carry on uh, watching the channel. It's a pleasure. Cheers, guys. Take care. See you. Thanks.
Take off and landing. I got that. Okay, we do take off and landing. That's the next one. I'll try and do that, Michael. Uh, before why don't I, why don't we try and do one at the end of the month? Um, and if you catch up with me on email, let me know if there's any dates that work for you better or not. I'll I'll try and do something. Thanks, guys. Take care. Have a good evening.